Welcome everyone. I am Mireya Solis, Director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar, U.S.-Taiwan Policy in 2021 and Beyond. Last week, Americans voted in record numbers and Joe Biden won the election. Today, our panelists will discuss what the incoming Biden administration will mean for the future of U.S.-Taiwan policy. Taiwan is an issue that has grown in public prominence in the United States. There have been growing questions about Taiwan's security and America's role in ensuring it. Our panelists have been at the heart of those discussions and will be able to put them in context for our audience. Our panelists will also discuss how the next administration will work with Taiwan to manage the different challenges that Taiwan faces, including its political situation, its international space, and security, economic, and technological issues. This conversation will be moderated by Ryan Haas, the Armicus Chair and Interim Good Chair in Taiwan Studies in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. Ryan, over to you. Thank you, Maria, for kicking off our event. I'm delighted to welcome an all-star panel of experts to help us take stock of where U.S. policy toward Taiwan stands now and how it might evolve following the U.S. presidential inauguration on January 20th. Uh, but before we dive into our discussion, I do want to introduce our four speakers. I'm going to be brutally efficient in my introductions uh, in order to preserve time for our discussion, but uh, their full biographies with uh, all their accomplishments can be found online. Richard Bush is one of America's foremost experts on Taiwan. After a distinguished career in government and at Brookings, he presently is a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. He has a book coming out in spring 2021 that I encourage everyone to purchase uh, titled Difficult Choices, Taiwan's Quest for Security and the Good Life. Bonnie Glazer also has deep expertise and is recognized as one of America's foremost experts on Taiwan and cross-strait issues. She, along with Richard and Mike Green, co-chaired a recent task force on the future of U.S. policy toward Taiwan. The task force report is available at CSIS's website. I encourage everyone to take a look. Bonnie is the director of the China Power Project and a senior advisor for Asia at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Shirley Lin is a leading voice on issues relating to economics and innovation in Asia. After a successful career in private equity and venture capital, working at the front lines of many of these issues, Shirley has uh, taken up scholarly pursuits. She is uh, a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings and also has a book project in the works. Eric Sayers is an expert on security issues relating to Taiwan. Formerly an advisor to the PACOM commander and a professional staff member of the Senate Armed Services Committee under John McCain, Eric is now a vice president at Deakin Global Strategies and an adjunct senior fellow at CNAS. So now turning to our conversation, uh, I plan to focus on six major baskets of issues over the next hour. The first will be setting the scene. Where are we right now? Then we will turn to uh, an examination of Taiwan's political situation. We will look at Taiwan's international space, discuss security issues, economic issues, as well as technology issues before we open the floor to questions and comments from our audience. So now setting the scene. I, I want to ask our expert panel, how would you describe the current state of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship and of cross-strait relations in this current moment? What will the next administration's inheritance be when it takes office in January? Bonnie, if we could start with you. Well, thank you, Ryan, and uh, 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 good to, to be with you for this discussion today. Now, the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, I think, is quite strong um, for several reasons. First, we are in a period of significant convergence between U.S. and Taiwan interests. Uh, and President Tsai has attached priority to the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. She's pursued, of course, a prudent and moderate policies toward mainland China. And this has helped to strengthen the relationship. Second, Taiwan is under growing pressure from China at a time when the United States is increasingly concerned about Chinese policies and ambitions um, around the world. And third, um, I think Taiwan increasingly has shown a willingness to provide 
public goods and to strengthen democracy and freedom around the world. And of course, it's exemplary performance, not only at home, but also in helping the world uh, at, the, at a time of COVID-19, I think is, uh, is, is, is one example. Um, and I think both sides have, uh, have worked to strengthen the relationship. So we've seen progress in the area of uh, defense and security and diplomatic coordination. The weakest area, of course, is the economic and trade pillar of the relationship. And uh, it will be, of course, this week that we will actually formally begin an economic dialogue uh, with Taiwan. Um, but that will focus on uh, protecting supply chains, energy, 5G. It will be held by the State Department, not by the U.S. Trade Representative Office. So there have been no trade talks uh, in uh, the years of the Trump administration. And President Tsai, of course, has lifted restrictions now on beef and pork, and, and there has not been a positive response in, in starting uh, uh, free trade talks. And then very briefly, I'd say on cross-strait relations, they've gradually deteriorated uh, over the last uh, four years. Uh, uh, Beijing refuses to deal directly with the democratically elected government in Taipei. The official communications were cut early uh, when Taiwan was elected. Uh, but really more recently, we've seen ties fray between uh, Beijing and the leading opposition party, the KMT. Um, and, and the Chinese are relying now, I think, more on sticks than on carrots increasingly in dealing with Taiwan. It's poached uh, eight of uh, Taiwan's diplomatic allies since uh, 2016. Um, and now we have PLA aircraft, of course, crossing the center line uh, beginning in March 2019 for the first time in 20 years. And um, uh, also, of course, now regularly going into the air defense identification zone. And this is all, you know, intimidation. Uh, President Tsai, of course, has continued to call for cross-trade dialogue, most recently in her October 10 speech. Um, and she called for the two sides to live in peace and said Taiwan is committed to upholding cross-strait stability, but that this is not something Taiwan can shoulder alone. Um, it is, of course, she said, the joint responsibility of both sides. And Beijing, of course, has shown no interest in taking up uh, her offer. So uh, back to you, Ron. Thank you, Bonnie. I think you've done a great job sort of laying the table for us. And now I'd like to turn to Richard. Uh, Richard, you've witnessed multiple presidential transitions. And so I have two questions for you about the transition process. The, the first, what should we expect in terms of how long it will take for the next administration's policy team and policy on Taiwan to come into focus. And in the interim period, what should we be looking for? What are what are likely signals of the likely direction that uh, a Biden administration's policy approach towards Taiwan will take? Um, thank you, Ryan, and hello to everyone in Zoom land. Um, my brief answer, Ryan, to your question is uh, months, not weeks, and perhaps several months. Uh, and we should consider the Biden team's immediate uh, priorities. First, get transition teams into various agencies to find out what those agencies have been doing for the last four years. Two, recreate the traditional interagency process that Donald Trump set aside. Third, fill the many, many policymaking positions across the government. So the next few months will be devoted more to policy process than policy substance. Now on substance, there's been a lot of speculation uh, about the Biden administration's policies on an array of issues. Um, this speculation is based on limited and often outdated data. The predictions are either premature or wrong. On any issue, real policy formulation starts now. Um, keep in mind that the broad, broader context here is both important and terrible. We are a country in crisis. The pandemic, the economic downturn, the divisions and rancor in our society, and the divisions and potential gridlock within the U.S. government. President Biden, I think, will have to spend the bulk of his time on these domestic crises. Um, this is not a bad thing, I think. Uh, the United, a United States that strengthens itself domestically where it is weak and corrects the mistakes of the last four years will be better able to act internationally. So for those who want to know today what Biden's Taiwan policy will be, my advice is please be patient. Um, 
on the question of what to look for, um, I think we will get some clues uh, about Taiwan policy in the weeks and months ahead. Um, President Biden's inaugural address will provide a general indication of his foreign and security policy. Um, what will he say, for example, about respect for democracy around the world? Next, uh, the confirmation process uh, for senior officials uh, will provide some insights into future policy. I'll be curious, for example, how the nominee to be the U.S. Trade Representative responds to a question about a bilateral trade agreement with Taiwan. Um, and there may be events that occur in the early months that are revel revelatory. Uh, it is important to recall that Taiwan policy will be embedded in broader Asia policy, including policy towards China. That does not mean that Taiwan policy will be a function of or derivative of China policy, whatever that will be, but it will be part of the larger whole. Still, please keep in mind, President-elect Biden voted for the Taiwan Relations Act. As Bonnie said, U.S. and Taiwan interests have been converging, and they have been converging since 2008. Neither President Biden nor his advisors are in any way naive about China's ambitions, including for Taiwan. Uh, President Biden himself and his senior advisors place a lot of importance on democracy and have respect for democratic systems like Taiwan. So although friends in Taiwan uh, need to be patient, they can also be confident. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. I, I think that that provides a really strong sort of foundation for uh, the rest of this discussion will take place uh, over the next hour. If I could, I'd like to turn to Eric next. Eric, I, I want to, to tap into your experience on Capitol Hill. Um, Richard was just talking about uh, partisan divisions and rancor uh, in the United States, but Taiwan has been an area that has uh, escaped that dynamic. Uh, there's been very strong bipartisan support on Capitol Hill for Taiwan. To what extent does that legacy lock in the new administration on sustaining the current course of uh, American policy toward Taiwan? And in what areas do you think there may be some room for adjustments? Of course, thanks, Ryan. Uh, and great to be on. Thanks for Brookings for inviting me today. Um, now, I think we can really expect Congress to continue to play a unique role in the relationship um, as they have since, since the Taiwan Relations Act, 1979. Um, you know, there's the interest level on the Hill for Taiwan, for China issues, for, you know, the Asia Pacific, the Indo-Pacific more broadly. It's never been higher. You know, when I, I wish I could have had this level of interest when I was a staffer five or six years ago. Um, now, in, in recent weeks with the election, we've lost some key members like Cory Gardner. Um, who, who had played a strong role in his first six years, his first term in the Senate. Um, but as we've seen in the last decade or so, as, as a number of the, the strong kind of foreign policy-minded, Asia-focused members have left the Senate, you know, there's, there's, no, there's, there's a long line of kind of smart, younger members who are interested in the region and, and are ready to, to step up. And now, looking forward, um, you know, I also believe... China and support for Taiwan, uh, as Richard mentioned, this is going to be a litmus test during the confirmation process this winter. Uh, in the past, you may have gotten a few questions here and there on trade and certain committees and on you know the South China Sea and other committees. But I think you know senators in, in a bipartisan fashion are kind of thinking and plotting now all the questions that they're going to ask across a range of committees, not just to the future Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense on Taiwan, um, but to the Commerce nominee, the, the, the nominee for the Treasury Department and USTR as well. Um, you know, and I also say as, a, you know, just yesterday, I, I had a, an hour long conversation with a senator who, you know, is focused on foreign policy, but hasn't focused as much on Taiwan. And that, that person just wanted to just talk about Taiwan for an hour and hear what's the latest, what can we be doing? What are the new ideas and where's the new energy? Um, now, you know, the Biden team has a, to your second part of your question, the Biden team has a tough task ahead. You know, they face concerns on the Hill, as well as in Taipei that, you know, the Trump administration's commitment was, was a high watermark of sorts uh, for the relationship and that Washington may now revert back, you know, to um, maybe previous form in, in previous administrations where, you know, there was a concern sometimes that Taiwan was more of a subset of U.S.-China relations. Um, what can we expect to be different? You know, I would expect there's going to be less high-level focus just naturally. You know, the, the visits, the State Department tweets on a weekly basis. Uh, the assistant secretary is giving you know, speeches at, at Brookings and other think tanks in Washington on a monthly basis. This has become a very natural pattern. Uh, we've all appreciated it in the last month. Um, 
Now, that's something I don't think we'll see quite the same uh, pace and rigor of. You know, we'll still see some of it as we have in the past. And then we also will, might see potentially fewer arms sales, not for political reasons, but I think because Taiwan has made such a large financial commitment to purchases over the next five and six years across a range of issues. So just to conclude, this gives, you know, I think the Biden team an opportunity to look at a number of areas where they can try to uh, answer this call and, and maintain strong momentum in the relationship. Uh, as, as was mentioned, they could focus on a trade agreement as part of a more narrow Biden trade agenda for the region. And we can certainly expect Congress to continue to push hard in a bipartisan fashion on that issue. Uh, they could work to elevate, tech, second, they could work to elevate Taiwan as a, as a global model for public health cooperation and for bringing attention to Taipei, you know, Taipei's successful response to COVID-19 and doing things like supporting their more participation in the World Health Organization. Uh, and finally, they could also make China, you know, the explicit priority in their national defense strategy. Uh, it was always China and Russia in this recent NDS. Um, even though the department liked to say China is the first priority, it wasn't ever explicitly that. Uh, so if we have a Michelle Flournoy as Secretary of Defense or someone in that model who's written very favorably on this topic and the need for prioritization of cross-strait deterrence, you know, I think an NDS could, could make it explicit and the cross-strait deterrence could be a, a principal planning objective for the department uh, in this new area. So that's just kind of three ideas on where the Biden administration might look to try to, you know, continue the momentum in the relationship. And I'll, and I'll finish there. Thanks, Ryan. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So surely we've uh, we've sort of set the table of how things look from Washington's perspective. If I could uh, ask you to to provide a insight into how things look from Taiwan's perspective. Uh, broadly speaking, it seemed that President Trump's Taiwan policy was met favorably in Taiwan. So what lessons should the incoming team take from that fact? And relatedly, where do you anticipate that the Taiwan authorities may encourage adjustments or improvements to the, the strategy and approach from the United States that we've seen in recent years? Uh, thank you, Ryan. I agree with all three panelists uh, uh, on their um, description that, of course, we're uh, in a process of not knowing what's going to happen yet. And uh, my being uh, the only person in Taipei today, I should uh, be, I think I should faithfully report how I feel because I've been talking extensively to different political parties, to younger folks. I'm teaching a class at National Jinji University uh, and being here during the American election is really exciting. Everybody wants to talk about uh, the election as if they're voting. Um, and it's really because of course they don't get to decide the election, but they care, uh, they think that it really determines Taiwan's future in many ways. Um, but a lot of people are very supportive of Trump's foreign policy uh, simply because they're so eager for Taiwan to have respect and dignity, which since Taiwan became democratic really uh, was elusive. It was a goal that was uh, not in sight. Now Trump was really welcome, uh, not because people didn't know the cost and benefit of Trump's policy, but because his administration was much more forthcoming in arms sales, uh, seemingly to expand Taiwan's international space, high level official contact. Uh, and uh, simply um, there's, a, there's a lot of reason to uh, think that this is the high watermark as Eric said, but there's also grumbling that Tsai has given in too much, uh, bought too much, too costly. These arms packages were they well designed, well thought out. These are problems that have been going on for years but also in allowing American beef and pork recently to come in. Uh, this is uh, tonight's uh, front page, uh, basically today's front page news and uh, um, uh, primetime television. But others simply believe that Taiwan is focusing too much on the US, uh, hoping for this partner to continue. Is the US policy sustainable? Will Biden continue? Will it backtrack? from Trump administration's uh, policy towards uh, Taiwan and China. And of course, most importantly, most people know uh, that uh, Trump administration's policy, of course, could be just using Taiwan as a pawn. And as uh, Bonnie has said, you know, is it really looking at Taiwan as a de democracy that could do a lot with other regional partners? And that would US just trade Taiwan away when it wants to complete a uh, trade deal where Taiwan is inconvenient. And I think memories although not for the young people, but the historical memory of being abandoned since the civil war and then later rapprochement and normalization still is very important to a lot of people. And so the anxiety for people to move into a possible uh, a new era um, uh, that is completely different than the last four years uh, is causing anxiety at such a high level uh, that this is, I think, what uh, most people don't realize uh, in terms of the support for what has been happening so far. Fascinating, thank you. I, 
Richard, I think Shirley has provided the perfect segue for us to, to move into a discussion of Taiwan's political situation. Uh, you have spoken and written uh, extensively uh, about Taiwan's need to forge a strong domestic consensus on its future uh, based on a realistic assessment of its strategic environment. But forging such a consensus is, is difficult in any democratic society. It's made even more difficult uh, by competing domestic demands inside Taiwan and the fact that China is geographically 90 miles away from Taiwan. So on balance, how would you grade Taiwan's progress to date in uh, forging a strong domestic consensus about its future? And what role, if any, is there for the United States in supporting the people of Taiwan uh, in this effort? I think you're on um, mute. Sorry. Um, the, the, uh, this is a really important question. Uh, I think it's telling that both President Ma ying and President Tsai Ing-wen, after having to grapple with the challenge of leading Taiwan for several years, each stressed the need for greater unity across the board. And we know of credible assertions that China itself has sought to sow divisions within Taiwan, um, and it certainly benefits from divisions. Um, there is a paradox here. Uh, that is, um, we will all we all can appreciate why Taiwan will be more effective in meeting the challenge from China if there's a broad consensus on how to do so. But democracy as a system encourages division and competition over policy and resources. And Taiwan is no exception. Uh, it is worth noting that there are some important areas of, agree of agreement across the island. Polling indicates that there is strong unanim unanimity concerning social values. People believe in principle that democracy is the best system of government. A significant majority wants to continue the status quo rather than run the risks associated either with unification or independence. Around 90% of those surveyed say they are either exclusively Taiwanese or both Chinese and Taiwanese. By the way, those terms aren't defined, so it's not clear what the finding means. On the other hand, there are a lot of issues on which there's significant disagreement. Economic policy, balancing the needs of young people, working people, and the elderly, the government budget, both revenue and expenditures, energy security, transitional justice, and so on. None of these issues are easy. Um, so it shouldn't surprise us that politicians and people disagree. Some issues are never resolved. You've laid out a variety of issues where there's contestation in the, in the Taiwan political system. What do you view as the most significant or sharpest area of policy difference between the leading political actors in Taiwan? Well, far and away, the biggest and most divisive challenge is how to cope with China. Political leaders and pub the public disagree over whether Beijing is an economic opportunity or a political and security threat over what strategy the island should adopt in response and the US place in that strategy, over how much to accommodate Be Beijing to best protect Taiwan's interests and how to mobilize resources and sustain public support. Uh, the Ma administration was more accommodating than the Tsai administration. The KMT is currently trying to figure out how to both accommodate Beijing and win elections. Um, so it's not easy. Yet whatever the degree of accommodation, and despite the anti-unification consensus of the Taiwan public, um, we need to recall that Beijing's ultimate objective, which is to incorporate Taiwan within the PRC system under the one country, two systems formula, it hasn't changed and it's unlikely to change. Um, I think Taiwan has gained a better sense of the constraints under which it operates but meeting the challenge from China is still very hard. The stakes are high and the costs of failure are profound. Resolving pressing policy dilemmas through a democratic system is not easy. Taiwan's no exceptions. Polls suggest that the public is ambivalent about Taiwan's democracy and doesn't have much respect for legislators or political parties. Um, Taiwan operates under a majoritarian system for electing legislators which means that the winning party uh, is over in, in in the legislative yuan. 
the losing party becomes very frustrated that it had, that it has a limited role in policy making. Civil society groups don't appear to have a lot of confidence in representative government, which has fostered a protest culture. Yet these movements and the minority party are much more successful in blocking what they oppose than in achieving what they seek. So, so given these dynamics, what's your forecast for the future of Taiwan politics? Are you optimistic about Taiwan's ability to forge a consensus on the way forward? Um, I have an acquaintance in Taiwan um, whom I found to be a shrewd observer of Taiwan politics. She spent a decade in the United States going to graduate school and then working. Uh, she returned to Taiwan a couple of years ago and I had a chance to get her impression of her own society after she'd been home for a while. What struck her most was the intensity of the conflict between the blue and green camps and the zero sum character of politics. Nisa uh, She was deeply disturbed that each camp saw each other as the enemy when in her view, the true adversary was about 90 miles across the Taiwan Strait. Um, clearly other democracies suffer from this sort of polarization and gridlock. Just look at the United States. But I do believe that Taiwan would do a better job of meeting its various policy challenges, particularly the one from China, if there were better cooperation and convergence of view between the two major parties. Um, deep division regarding the degree to which China is a threat and what to do about it only weakens Taiwan and gives the advantage to Beijing. Um, now that's easy for me to say, um, it's very hard to do. Uh, I don't think it should be impossible. After World War II, Democrats and Republicans came to an agreement that the challenge from the Soviet Union was so dire that the United States needed a bipartisan Soviet policy if it was to be secure. Taiwan itself demonstrated remarkable unity in coping with coronavirus in part because there was a shared understanding of the threat it posed. So because the stakes are high, I hope that politi political leaders can work together for the good of the entire society in facing uh, its many challenges. I suspect that such cooperation will have to start at the top. I'm fairly certain that the stakes are too high to risk failure because of continued division and gridlock. Um, I rather doubt that there's much that the United States in the throes of its own dysfunction has much to offer uh, to Taiwan in the way of assistance. This really is something that Taiwan has to do for itself if it has the will to do so. Um, still, I can leave you with a warning uh, attributed to Benjamin Franklin at the time that he signed the Declaration of Independence. He said, we must indeed all hang together or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. Thanks. Maybe could I, Richard, respond to your uh, observation? Please. Yeah, I think the last two years, and I'm looking forward to uh, buying your book and uh, reading <laughs> what's in it. Uh, but I think you're, address you're addressing this question, of course, with your entire book. Um, and uh, and I, what, what I wanted to say was, I think the last two years, there's been some dramatic change. Um, and I feel it very strongly this year. I've come into Taiwan three times this year, going out, coming back. And uh, I think both the KMT and the DPP would say that there's no doubt the biggest problem for each of their party is China. Uh, and so it's really changed in the last two years since Xi Jinping decided to equate reunification with one country, two system, with neither party really could accept because mm -hmm. the, the voters are not accepting it. So what has really happened is the last two years, most importantly, I want to respond to your um, thought about top down. I think really to create a consensus in Taiwan, there needs to be bottom up and top down meeting of the mind. And right now there is something missing in that. Uh, in both parties, that there's a lot of top down going on. But bottom up, actually, the younger generation are very uniform. Very few people I've met who are young want to volunteer to go to China, even though even three years ago, that was different. With all the preferential treatment that China was offering, uh, the Taiwanese were going to China to work, thinking that they could have the cake and eat it too. And today, that's very different. Um, and this year, it's really strengthened partially because of COVID also because of the decoupling for many reasons. You just can't go to China 
uh, let's say go to grad go to undergraduate and then go to the United States for grad school and then come back to work for uh, a technology company, let's say. So I think all of this actually means that the United States have a very important role in enhancing economic cooperation with Taiwan so that Taiwan is not continuing to rely on low cost manufacturing in China to bring in money and to send out talent in a brain drain form, but to really work on cooperating with the United States and other like-minded country to create more jobs and innovation so that the economy can be elevated. Um, and, uh, and so I guess I just wanted to add, I think the US has a very important role. Uh, and what the Trump administration has done is to put away with the old order, but did not erect anything new for us to hang our hat on. And therefore, uh, it's really important to see what goes, uh, what, what, what is going to happen going forward in terms of uh, uh, having real, uh, perhaps, investment treaty or uh, some kind of uh, uh, a trade agreement. Uh, thanks, Shirley. Those are really great points. And we will, we will get to uh, a deeper economic discussion in a moment, but before we do so, I want to take a moment to talk about international space. Uh, because Shirley was just talking about the squeeze that Beijing was putting on Taiwan. Uh, one of the areas where it's been felt most acutely is on international space issues. Um, <clears throat> now, it's long been a policy priority of the United States to create opportunities for Taiwan to make contributions to the international system. And through those contributions to earn the dignity and respect they deserve on the world stage. So with that, uh, Bonnie, where do you see room for growth in the United States efforts to expand Taiwan's international space in the coming years? Well, I'd start by saying that there has long been bipartisan support and we've seen in Democrat and Republican administrations, uh, efforts to expand Taiwan's participation in the international community. Uh, probably the, the mechanism that so far has been most effective and particularly creative was the establishment of the global cooperation framework uh, under the Obama administration. And that essentially started uh, workshops. It was, it was a US-Taiwan joint effort uh, to bring together representatives from countries mostly around Taiwan uh, to uh, engage in these workshops and get training from uh, Taiwan, enable uh, experts in Taiwan uh, to share their expertise in areas uh, that relate to health or uh, media literacy, uh, a whole range uh, of, of, of issues. And uh, that uh, was picked up by the Trump administration and expanded very effectively, of course, making it more multilateral. Japan is now a co-partner. We've seen uh, Australia uh, co-host, Sweden co-host some workshops. And there's still a lot of potential in that mechanism. So I think going forward, we will see that continue. Perhaps more resources put to it um, uh, by the United States, maybe also by Taiwan and other countries. Um, it can, uh, wor workshops are now being held uh, virtually, of course, but uh, when uh, the vaccine is deployed and it is safe to hold in other countries, I think we're going to see this really go global. Uh, and, and there will be, uh, for example, some workshops that in Latin America, one is already taking place uh, virtually in Guatemala. Uh, so um, we have not seen Europe other than uh, Sweden join. And I think that's where the great potential is to expand it. And then of course, um, there's no doubt that trying to restore Taiwan's uh, observer status in the World Health Assembly uh, the decision-making arm of the World Health Organization provides uh, the best opportunity. Um, and, and, and not only is it an opportunity, but it's also, I think, urgent. Uh, I mean, Taiwan's, uh, again, exemplary performance uh, during the pandemic and controlling the spread uh, provides uh, uh, obvious, um, uh, compelling reasons for Taiwan to be at the table. And many countries that are reluctant to have maybe high level uh, cooperation with uh, Taiwan or reluctant to have uh, uh, maybe uh, some kind of trade agreement with Taiwan are nevertheless very supportive of strengthening Taiwan's participation in uh, the World Health Organization. Uh, with the election of, uh, of uh, uh, President-elect now Biden, the United States is not going to withdraw from the World Health Organization. And if we had, then our, our ability to strengthen Taiwan's role certainly would have been um, uh, circumscribed. So this is a good development, not only for the US, but also 
uh, for uh, Taiwan. Um, and specifically in the uh, task force report that uh, you mentioned, which thank you, uh, Ryan, and also Eric Sayers for participating in the effort. Uh, we did endorse uh, not only Taiwan's, uh, the restoration of its observer status, but we called specifically for G7 countries to uh, issue a joint statement uh, endorsing uh, Taiwan's return to the World Health Assembly and, and frankly to uh, to support Taiwan's meaningful participation in many other uh, UN agencies and uh, multilateral organizations. And I do think we have a, a moment now where there are more and more countries that are willing uh, to support Taiwan, whether or not we will be able to be successful remains to be seen. But I will cite just briefly one small example, which makes me a little bit hopeful. And that is that uh, the UN uh, uh, development, the, the group of countries developing the vaccine under uh, COVAX uh, uh, has included Taiwan as a participant and China did not block that. And I think that shows that Beijing recognizes this is not a moment that they can stand up and try and snuff out uh, Taiwan and uh, prevent it from participating. And maybe that shows that there, if there is sufficient support from other countries around the world that we can successfully push to have Taiwan reserve, uh, return as an observer uh, to the World Health Assembly. Thank you, Bonnie. You've really laid out a roadmap for, for the way forward. If I could just ask one very brief uh, follow-up question. Uh, AIT, the American Institute in Taiwan, has played a useful intermediation role between U.S. authorities and Taiwan authorities, given the unofficial nature of the relationship. Uh, Taiwan also does not have direct connectivity with the United Nations system. Do you think that there's any, any space for a model built around to the AIT to provide intermediation between Taiwan authorities and, and the UN system? Well, I do think we should be more creative uh, because uh, so far uh, we have not been sufficiently effective. I mean, we've really seen ever since uh, uh, President Tsai was elected and, and we had, there had been some very small progress, of course, during the Mayimjiao era, and not, not as extensive as I think many had hoped, including President Ma. Uh, we didn't see Taiwan uh, get into Interpol, and we didn't see Taiwan actually get any sustainable status in the International Civil Aviation Organization, even though it was able to send a delegation once uh, as a guest of the, I think, the president of, the, of, of uh, ICAO. Uh, so we should think about more creative ways. I don't know if uh, an AIT-like organization in and of itself would do enough because as I mentioned, I think what we really need is the support um, and very active support of a large number of countries in the, in the international community. If this is primarily a US effort, um, I just don't think that we will be able uh, to be successful. Uh, we really have to build support in, in the UN and in the UN uh, General Assembly probably overall. But you know, it's worth noting that uh, one of the big problems here is the General Assembly Resolution 2758 that expelled Taiwan from the UN and its functional agencies. But it wasn't clear on, uh, or, or nor was it final, on uh, the participation by Taiwan in UN activities in forms other than membership. It didn't recognize Taiwan as part of the, of the PRC. Um, so we really do need, I think, to try and combat that narrative that is coming from China that uh, UN Resolution 2758 already resolved this issue and Taiwan has no, uh, no right to have any voice uh, in the UN. So we need to come up with ways to uh, protect the interests of the uh, more than 23 million citizens in Taiwan, but also to allow Taiwan to contribute its expertise to addressing um, regional and global problems. And the UN is still very important uh, in that matter. So we should be thinking more creatively along with our like-minded uh, uh, allies and, and partners on how to do that going forward. Thank you. Uh, there's, there's so much that you've put on the table to discuss, but the, we have the tyranny of time. So I'm going to, to move us forward into a discussion about security issues. And I'd like to turn to you, Eric, to help walk us through this. You mentioned in your comments a moment ago that Taiwan has made significant arms purchases in recent years. Um, and there have been defense reforms inside Taiwan uh, that have been notable. Yet, in spite of these efforts, uh, there is a perception 
uh, that the threat continues to grow uh, from the mainland as the mainland's uh, military capabilities expand. So given this reality, what would your recommendation be? Where should we encourage Taiwan to concentrate its resources to strengthen its defenses? And where should, should the United States be focusing its efforts to, to strengthen deterrence? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Ryan. Um, great questions. So the positive thing is that most items on, on my list of what Taiwan needs to invest in, you know, if you asked me to write this list a few years ago, you know, they've started to be addressed in recent years. Um, I guess ideally we can work to move some of these delivery timelines for different systems to the left. Um, you know, the, the recent, we're not, we're not gonna call it a package, the recent series of items that were, that were noticed, um, you know, many of those are four or five, six years away. The same with some of the uh, fighters and other systems before that. And that's not just a industrial base capacity issue. It's a prioritization issue in FMS with, with other countries. And so, you know, there, there are ways that we can consider and a Biden administration consider to try to move Taiwan up in the, in the line and the priority. So moving it to the left, you know, I think would be the first thing. Uh, and, and continuing to focus on increasing, you know, the number, the number of anti-ship and anti-air weapons in the, in the ROC arsenal. Um, you know, again, recent weeks, these different sales really speak to an emphasis on the areas that Washington has been emphasizing for, for years now. Uh, and, and we should all see that as a positive thing. Uh, and, and there's still steps to take further in that, in that direction. You know, but we, we still have this challenge, you know, like in our own military investment portfolio here in the United States, we have to continue to work, think critically as partners about Taiwan's investments. You know, for instance, I continue to be skeptical when I see um, the Navy, for instance, investing in large amphibious ships that have high readiness costs when the Navy really needs to be investing in more limited resources, you know, in areas that enhance its anti-surface posture, uh, for example. From the U.S. side, you know, and just sort of being brief with this, the U.S. has to do more when it comes to training. I might be a broken record on this, but, you know, building operability by sending trainers to Taipei like we do now when we sell different systems, that's good, but that's just, that falls short. That's not enough. If, if cross-strait stability is such a grave concern, and a top priority for the, the national defense strategy, they would need a rigorous exercise program that includes kind of service level and even joint training with ROC military. Um, nowhere else do we prescribe so much importance to a country's security, you know, for American interests and do so little to ensure it at the same time. Uh, Congress should also ask for a list of all the training exercises that happen each year. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we, we need to expand the definition of Washington's commitment to Taipei beyond just the dollar figure of arms sales and, you know, these exercises that are already, sorry, these training I, I, regiments that are already occurring uh, and those that I'm suggesting on top of that, it would, wouldn't be too difficult and it would be effective legislatively to ask just for an annual report on, on what's being done so that, you know, members of Congress, uh, other Taiwan watchers can, can have a broader appreciation for that commitment. And, and I'll just finish by saying, you know, one other idea. If this is the serious challenge, we all agree it is, and it's becoming in recent years and in recent months, really, we need to consider other bold proposals. Um, one would be redirecting some of the resources that you know we have chosen as a nation to send to countries like Pakistan for the last 20 years, but recently cut off to Taiwan, similar to what we do with Israel. This is somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars per year. Uh, this could be a stick and carrot agreement. You know, as part of it, Taipei could commit to a specific plan for bringing its spending on defense to 3% of GDP or somewhere in that, that range by a, a certain time. It could be used for professionalizing its military and training. Uh, it could be used to explicitly purchase American military systems like in our agreements with Israel. Um, there are risks and challenges associated with this idea, but if we see Taiwan as, you know, in the future as a grave threat to our security interests and our, again, our American interest in the region, you know, there, there's ideas like this that I think are gonna have to be on the table that in the previous decade or two just weren't in the cards for consideration. Thank you, Eric. That's a uh... That very uh, help, helpful orientation on the way forward. I want, before we move on to economic issues, I want to make sure that uh, Shirley, Richard, or Bonnie have a chance to weigh in on, on security issues because it's something that's been front of mind for, for many of them. Is there anyone, anything that anyone would like to add to uh, or, or amend? I guess, Ryan, I would add uh, for, the, for Taiwanese, of course, with limited resources, the trade-off of spending more on uh, defense uh, is an issue that is uh, long being troubling. But right now, I think there's a, really a lot of support for, a, uh, for defining and designing a cost-effective deterrent and defense policy uh, that is uh, uh, going to last. Uh, and that uh, some people in Taiwan are also talking about, uh, for example, 
uh, it, the Biden administration will be more multilateral, therefore add Taiwan to the quad uh, to basically move beyond a bilateral relationship um, and uh, move Taiwan into, as Bonnie says, international space in, in many cr more creative ways. Um, and uh, defense, I think, is at the heart of this discussion of moving from bilateral to multilateral. I would just add really quickly, Ryan, that um, uh, the U.S. has talked, and President Tsai herself, of course, has publicly talked about bolstering Taiwan's reserves. And we haven't come up with a real good way to do that. Um, maybe we should create some mechanism to help them learn from uh, our National Guard, but we may not be the best model for Taiwan. This is often a problem that we have the closest defense ties with Taiwan. Most other countries don't, and yet there are often better models for Taiwan. They shouldn't necessarily uh, look, at, look to us, but uh, maybe we can help facilitate some interaction with uh, other countries that are better models uh, for Taiwan. Uh, Israel and Singapore are often mentioned as useful models to build a, a sort of whole of society effort, uh, which is, I think, what's really missing in Taiwan. For a long time, the military uh, has not uh, been highly regarded uh, in society by the public. Uh, so people have not necessarily wanted to, uh, to serve and with them shifting to an all volunteer force, uh, this is going to be essential going forward. So there really needs to be more of a focus in Taiwan on understanding and appreciating the threat um, uh, throughout the entire society um, in a way that uh, they just have not done for, for many, many years. Thank you. Shirley, if it's possible, I'd like to turn to you next. Uh, you've been writing about, talking about, and thinking about uh, a term called the high income trap and how Taiwan is working through it. Can you help us understand wh what does that term mean and how is Taiwan doing? In some ways, I had to explain a bit more when I started the project two years ago, but now there's a lot more sympathy to what used to be called Taiwan's China dilemma. Now, basically, if you look at it, uh, Taiwan's bigger problem is the high income trap like the United States. It needs more jobs, just as technological progress is moving towards maybe taking jobs away from working class, uh, middle, um, the middle class. And so um, uh, Taiwan has this issue that of course with declining growth as it becomes a wealthy uh, um, society uh, that there needs to be more competitiveness, more innovation. And so that's what uh, basically the United States needs, make America great again. And in many ways, it's similar to what Taiwan is trying to do, diversify trade and investment away from China. But at the same time, China was Taiwan's only uh, economic hope many people would contend. So that really gives you a sense of the, of the dilemma. But in the last uh, year and a half, after much has happened in Hong Kong, I think many people are saying, uh, this is not the way to go. Diversifying is the right strategy. Bonnie has written about uh, Go South policy, diversifying into Southeast Asia, where the growth is very high uh, and uh, they, um, they're more like-minded democracies, uh, is really now accepted, except the implementation of it is very difficult. And I think in this regard, there's a few things that uh, will be quite important. And that is, of course, how companies can remain competitive in this uh, when the global supply chain decouples. As uh, we go into different sphere of, um, uh, of technological standards, what will happen to the companies that are most competitive in Taiwan? Will there be innovation? Um, and I think that uh, what Bonnie has just talked about in terms of GCTF, I think it's very important. Uh, the problem is in the past, of course, when Taiwanese students graduate, going to China was easy and natural same language, same culture, similar culture, uh, and uh, low cost manufacturing was drawing people in. As people now realize they don't want to go there uh, and there's uh, there are some choices to be made. Uh, what is of course interesting is uh, Taiwan also uh, relying on the United States has stepped up to, for example, last, uh, Last April, I um, moderated something uh, on women's empowerment with 15 countries. Bringing like-minded countries together so that talent can circulate is also something uh, you had asked about AIT, is doing quite a bit on talent circulation, upgrading Taiwan's workforce, uh, and working uh, with advanced economies to uh, make everyone, uh, all the economies more competitive. This is very important for the United States and for Taiwan. So I think the, um, realizing some kind of economic ties is right now urgent uh, and important for the next stage. And so what would your advice be to an incoming Biden administration? If you accept that, that uh, you know, economic security is the foundation of national security, 
and that it is in America's interest for Taiwan to be economically competitive. What, from a policy perspective, how, how would you encourage uh, an incoming team to be thinking about ways to, to support Taiwan's economic competitiveness? I think, first of all, to um, put Taiwan in a multilateral framework, uh, being part of, for example, CPTPP or possibly back to TPP, when Taiwan doesn't have a chance to be an RCEP uh, led by China, I think it's important so it's not bilateral. And second, to make it more sustainable. So like I said, Trump may have made the noise but nothing really within the Trump uh, foreign policy was, you know, was their dependability, if you will, reliability. Uh, and, uh, and I think um, uh, within that, uh, the, the third part, of course, is to have much more public private engagement so that the, the tech companies we're talking about that really, uh, Taiwan was just uh, ranked uh, as the fifth most, uh, what did Bloomberg call it? Uh, highest uh, potential for innovation just this week. But what does this really mean in terms of benefiting a large number of people in a democracy to give uh, legitimacy to the government to uh, be effective in carrying out uh, foreign policy? I think all of this is very important so that um, everyone can benefit from uh, the change and the upgrade of relationship. Uh, so th th those, are, those are the things I would focus on. And I just wanna say lastly, I just went to Yo Ma's concert yesterday in Taipei with 4,000 people. I think Taiwan's success in dealing with COVID-19 and leading to one of the probably best economic growth prospect in 2021, um, better than most Asian neighbors, is really phenomenal uh, and should be something to show the world that a democracy can balance basically freedom uh, and uh, fighting the virus uh, with uh, um, economic growth. Fascinating. Um, if I could, uh, a related topic is technology. Uh, on the technology front, it appears that Taiwan's leading firms increasingly are having to navigate between sort of competing pressures from uh, the United States and China. Uh, how do you see these dynamics playing out in the, the coming years? And what role do you see for the United States policy in supporting Taiwan's tech sector uh, remaining at the, the sort of the leading edge of innovation? I'd love to start with you, Shirley, but Eric, I know you've been thinking a lot about this too, so I'd, I'd welcome you to jump in too. Yeah, I love to hear what Eric uh, will say, but briefly, I think that the recent examples of, for example, Foxconn going to Wisconsin and TSMC going to Arizona are examples of, uh, you wonder, is it really rewarding for them to go and onshore, you know, uh, in the United States, uh, uh, help um, create investments there? I think the, the issue is that private companies uh, need to really think about uh, where it will be most competitive uh, in this uh, um, sort of uh, basically now we're going to two separate systems uh, and many of them feel like unintended victims. And I think large part of the policy in both Taiwan and the US uh, isn't really with, uh, you know, with wide consultation with these companies. And that is very troubling because the companies really need to take a lead at how this goes forward. But more importantly, the United States policy um, uh, in terms of uh, trying to change the technology policy, is it trying to make China part of the United the standards that the United States would like to see, or trying to really decouple in order to to punish China? And I think these are questions that need to be answered before uh, everyone else can comply and work together. Yeah, thanks. I, I look, Taiwan is caught in the middle of these U.S.-China technology tensions, not because it, it did anything wrong, right, but because companies like like TSMC and, and MediaTek and, and Foxconn and others, they've become so central. Um, TSMC, especially when it comes to the global semiconductor industry. So, you know, we should view these technology linkages um, as an opportunity for expanding the scope of the U.S.-Taiwan uh, economic and national security relationship. Uh, I would expect the Biden administration to to continue in many ways to deploy some of the same tools the Trump Commerce Department has when it comes to export controls. I don't see a Trump administration likely to take or come to different conclusions on on Huawei and then Washington's concerns about Huawei, for instance, um, you know, there, and there, there may be an effort even to go further and focus on multilateral controls with Taiwan and Japan and others. I think those are going to be difficult conversations, conversations that Taipei and Tokyo and Seoul and others don't necessarily want to have. But, you know, I think the, the Biden administration and the Biden campaign was very clear that, you know, they didn't necessarily agree, disagree with, with the, uh, the, the ends that we were seeking, they just disagreed with the means and they thought we could go about it in a more multilateral way. So this will inevitably mean, you know, more difficulty for, for companies like TSMC and MediaTek in the semiconductor realm. But just to conclude, maybe bring it back to, to Congress at the beginning. You know, I, I also expect 
especially if we have a Republican Senate here in Washington that, that limits some of uh, a Biden administration's uh, domestic spending uh, agenda, you know, that Biden will look to support existing bipartisan pieces of legislation in Congress, uh, like the semiconductor manufacturing uh, bipartisan legislation that was originally two bills and is coming together into one. You know, I expect this is going to be included in the NDAA and, and be, you know, fi signed out and passed by the end of the year. Uh, and this is really an effort to enhance some of the funding uh, for for not just the TSMC plant facility in Arizona, but but competitively for other American companies that look to expand you know, their own semiconductor manufacturing base here in the United States. Uh, that'll still be a fight next year when it comes to the appropriations uh, and where it is going. But you know, I think this really reflects a broader agenda where we've seen in Congress and the administration the last two or three years focused so much on the defense side, the restrictions and, and how do we control what the investments and the restrictions on technology to a more balanced agenda where you see this offense these do. Well, how do we invest in our competitive advantages vis-a-vis -vis China? And you, you know, you see leading Republican and Democrat senators uh, and members of Congress with taking a role on that. Thanks. Great. Now we have a, a, a stream of questions coming in from around the world uh, from our audience to all of you. Uh, unfortunately, we have limited time, so I won't be able to get to all of them, but I did want to pose several of them. Uh, the first question is about the new southbound policy and how a incoming Biden administration should support or, um, or approach the Taiwan's new southbound policy. I know, Bonnie, you've been thinking a lot about that, so I'll, I'll give you the right to uh, first refusal on responding to that. Uh, second, there is a question about FTA negotiations. Uh, what is the panel's handicapping of the likelihood of progress in a Biden administration on launching and advancing uh, US-Taiwan FTA negotiations? And then the third question uh, for, for the group is from Tina Chung, who is a reporter at Voice of America, who asks, um, she, she notes that uh, the Biden administration, it's expected will maintain America's strong support for Taiwan. What does the panel think will be the areas the new administration will differ the most in terms of approach with the current Trump administration on Taiwan issues? So those are uh, three questions for, for you guys to uh, approach however you see fit. We have about four minutes left, so we'll be rather efficient. Bonnie, can we start with you? Sure, I will be brief. Um, I want to note that, uh, uh, Vice, that President-elect Biden did speak uh, yesterday with the leaders of uh, Japan and Australia and uh, South Korea. And in all three of those conversations in the readout, there was a phrase that was used, uh, secure, and prosperous Indo-Pacific. This is an objective that we share with our allies. This is also an objective we certainly share with Taiwan. And uh, the Trump administration has been rather explicit about including Taiwan in what was, has been called the free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, if we're gonna call it the secure and prosperous Indo-Pacific, I certainly hope that there will be uh, a way to include uh, Taiwan in that. Um, my expectation is that a, a Biden administration will be somewhat less uh, public, visible, and in your face with Beijing about what it is doing with Taiwan. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it will do things differently, uh, particularly in the defense area where uh, we are concerned about the erosion of deterrence uh, in the Taiwan Strait. And I think there is going to be a, a commitment to not only bolstering our own ability uh, to credibly intervene in a cross-strait conflict, uh, but also to help Taiwan to defend itself. Uh, so I think that's uh, one area of uh, difference. And on an FTA, I'll let others comment, but my view is that the one area where there's been, um, it's been very difficult to judge what the Biden administration will do is overall trade policy. So um, if we start out out of the gate, uh, putting a, a priority on, on China, then uh, Taiwan could get caught up in that again. And I certainly hope that it does not. Uh, I think that there, are, there is a, a good argument to make for why we should begin uh, trade negotiations with Taiwan. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, why don't we go to Shirley next and then we'll have Eric and Richard close us out. Okay, I guess on, on New Southbound policy, I agree with what Bonnie said and I just emphasize, I think New Southbound policy is an example of the limitation that Taiwan could do something bilaterally. New Southbound policy is what we call the basically the 1.0 uh, with uh, uh, more effort, Taiwan could keep trying to do more with each of these countries. But unless there is a GCTF, unless there's some kind of multilateral next step, I think the, all the problems that 
a Biden administration could present to Taiwan is well understood here, but the opportunity is also very, very, uh, I think, immense. And I wrote an op-ed in Chinese in the leading newspaper here on Monday to say basically the multilateral focus could mean we'll move on from bilateral to more multilateral engagement. And only in that way can uh, Taiwan really uh, enhance uh, what it's been trying to do. Um, so um, I will also leave the FTA question to the next two panelists. All right, Eric, over to you. Yeah, not too much more to add. And, and Bonnie covered this well, but I, I really just, I think a lot of things will remain the same as we talked about. But as I also said, you know, the, the pitch of, of diplomatic language of speeches and e-diplomacy and the repetition of that, that'll just be a bit softer. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the commitment has, has diminished. And, and I think that in many ways, you know, there may be new opportunities like the, the free trade agreement that, you know, the Trump administration clearly did not uh, take an interest in pursuing when they had that opportunity or that opening. You know, that may be an opportunity or a place for a Biden administration to place its emphasis in, in the first year or two that, that could set itself apart and, and build on what's occurred in the last four years. Thank you. Richard, final word to you. I, I think you're on, yeah. One thing that I think will be different is that we will have a um, a, a regular interagency process, which I think is good for Taiwan, rather than having uh, a sort of divided U.S. government. I hope that at some point we can move uh, to a BTA with Taiwan, but I agree that the Democratic Party has to sort out its approach to trade first. Um, I um, concur with uh, Eric's view that um, we will not necessarily be so public in what we do towards Taiwan. Um, I think this is a good thing because uh, if we look back over the last four years, um, what happened when the U.S. Uh, took uh, public initiatives uh, towards Taiwan, it was not the United States that was punished. It was Taiwan that was punished. And Taiwan doesn't need that kind of punishment. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you all for uh, tremendous contributions to a really rich conversation. Uh, I also want to thank Adrian Chorn, Suzanne Schaefer, and our AV team at Brookings for making this all happen behind the scenes. Thank you all, and uh, see you soon. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.